to those of you that I've never met before, uh, thanks for joining our Medicare presentation today. Uh, the way I do these is they're very interactive. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself and stop me right in the middle of the presentation because uh, the presentation is for you and it's about you guys learning Medicare, not about me getting through some slides. So please uh, be proactive. I, there's a bunch of you here in the, uh, the room and I'm gonna be paying attention to the slides. So it's a little tough if you just raise your hand. Um, I need you to actually, if you don't mind, please just, just uh, interrupt me. Uh, Vanya, can you just confirm that you can see my presentation up there? So I have yes. right screen share. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, fantastic. Uh, a couple ground rules here too is that I am not uh, a Medicare licensed uh, or a Medigap policy or Medicare Advantage. I, you have a separate presentation of which the UCSD folks will come in and give you the specific policies. Uh, my job here, or what I've been tasked to do since the days of Suzanne Jaffe with Medicare, is just to give you a background, a uh, so you have a, a working understanding of what Medicare is. I understand that most people know that it's an insurance program, but how the public-private partnership works between the government and private insurers, and try to give you a framework of what type of uh, expenses you can expect and what some of the things that Medicare will cover and what it doesn't cover, some of the pitfalls and some of the landmines that you want to certainly avoid stepping on. So without further ado, let's get started. Three key points on Medicare, and this is a pretty long presentation, uh, and I do have a one o'clock, so I'm gonna try to get through this pretty quickly. Uh, but if I start speaking too quickly, Vanya, please buzz in and tell me to slow down. <laughs> but if you not enroll in Medicare on time, you're gonna pay a penalty, and the penalty is twofold. It's gonna be in your part B potentially and your part D potentially. If you not get the right private insurance to go to Medicare, you can pay too much in premiums out of, um, or out-of-pocket costs. And then uh, third point, if you do not plan for higher health care costs in retirement, you can run out of money and not be able to get the care you need. So not meant to scare you in any way, shape, or form, but just to give you a background on uh, what you can expect as you enter the Medicare realm. What is Medicare? Uh, who needs to enroll in Medicare and when? And how do you enroll in Medicare? That's the first part we're going to tackle. And then part two, we'll go over... How much does Medicare cost? What does it cover? And what is it, more importantly, what does it not cover? Uh, and how does private insurance work with Medicare and that public-private partnership? Um, and then finally, part three, we'll discuss briefly two reasons your healthcare expenses will be higher in the future, because of course, inflation, increased need for services, and I have some studies and some uh, numbers around that. And then uh, <clears throat> we'll briefly touch on long-term care. I know that's a separate presentation here at uh, uh, UCSD, which I would highly encourage you to attend after um, for this Medicare presentation. So, healthcare inflation in the United States. Uh, this is through uh, last year. You can see 2019, 4.6%. 2020, pretty pandemic, a little less. 2021, 2.2. 2022, 4%. And in 2023, it was closer to 5, 6%. Um, healthcare uh, inflation is, is certainly a problem. It's a, it's a problem when it comes to your private insurance and, and the, the cost of the policies, but more importantly, digging into your retirement funds. And you want, of course, your pension and or your retirement funds to be able to keep up with your medical needs as you go into retirement. So part one, let's talk about enrollment with Medicare. So who pays for health care in the United States? Well, before age uh, 65 and after age 65 for some of you, uh, your primary uh, insurance comes from your employer group health plan, which, of course, you have a wonderful one there at UCSD. Uh, retiree health insurance, if you retire prior to 65 at UCSD, COBRA, which just stands for the Consolidated Omnibus Reconciliation Act, I believe of like 1986 or 85. Most of you are familiar with COBRA, not necessarily at UCSD, especially if you retire. Uh, individual health insurance, of course, in the exchanges. And then the other would be something like I have from retiring from the military at 60, I'll have TRICARE. So a lot of this Medicare stuff doesn't apply to me, um, but I still will be signing up for Medicare at age 65. And just that my supplemental plan will be free through TRICARE through the Navy. Uh, and after age 65, Medicare typically becomes the first payer. There is a very large exception, and that's if you're covered by a company plan that has 20 or more employees. At UCSD, they want you to sign up, I believe, for Medicare, even if you continue to work past 65. And then your other insurance will pay second. So what this means for you, unless you have creditable coverage and a plan that covers 20 or more employees, you must enroll in Medicare when you turn 65. And it's very company specific. I know most of you here at UCSD uh, will be signing up for Medicare at 65 as a primary payer, but keeping uh, your UCSD supplemental insurance if you are still actively working. And if you retire, then obviously the retiree plans. So what if you don't enroll in Medicare at time? Well, unfortunately, you can pay a late enrollment penalty and that penalty 
equates to usually 10% of the premium and it's a lifetime penalty. So they really want to encourage folks to make sure they sign up on time. We'll talk about sign up periods here in a second. Your healthcare uh, expenses may not be covered by insurance and your private insurance options can be limited if you don't sign up on time. So you want to certainly do your initial enrollment and get it correct. Okay, so what is Medicare? Uh, it's the National Health Insurance Program for people of age 65 and over, founded in 1965 under the Medicare Act, right? Administered by the Centers for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services. And your enrollment is through Social Security. Now, if you attended my Social Security a lecture last week or you're planning on attending this coming Thursday, you know that one of the big tenets of Social Security that I believe most people should consider is delaying taking Social Security, uh, which means, you know, to probably till 70 for most people. Um, and that requires you to pay your Part B premium of Medicare out of pocket because normally your Part B premium comes straight out of your Social Security check. That's one thing that you need to be cautious of. If you are not taking Social Security when you start Medicare, you need to make sure you set up for payments outside of your Social Security check that you are not receiving. So everyone over age 65, all U.S. citizens and legal residents who have lived in the United States continuously for at least five years, and some people under 65 qualify under disability, and that's as early as 55. So here are the four parts of uh, Medicare, Medicare, excuse me. You have part A and B, which is provided by Medicare. This is the government side of the private public partnership. And then you have part C, which we'll see here is very comprehensive. It's like a Medicare Advantage plan, um, kind of like a, a Kaiser would be an example of a Medicare Advantage plan where you're getting all of your stuff in one place. And then you have potentially your part D over here. So Part D is your Medicare prescription drug coverage, which is a private insurer that contracts with Medicare. Uh, and then you also have your Medicare supplement or the, the policy that will take care of some of the different premiums and deductibles and things that we're gonna discuss in a second. To look at it a different way, right? Over here on the left, we have what I would call traditional Medicare. Your Part A, which is your HI, hospitalization insurance. Your Part B, which is your medical insurance or your doctor's visits, et cetera. And then part D, so you have a, a, a drug plan that goes along with your A and B, and then you have a Medigap or Medicare supplemental insurance plan that you pick out in a private, um, in a private marketplace and usually yearly renewals. So you're going to want to make sure you do a lot of research uh, yourself to make sure you have the right supplemental plan and you get the right one within the UC system if you're a retiree or if you're you're joining us and you are not a UC employee, you're going to definitely want to make sure that you speak with somebody that is knowledgeable about the different plans. On the right side, we have uh, Medicare Advantage. These plans are like HMOs or PPOs and typically include Part A, B, and D all put together, and that's the Medicare Advantage side. So how do you enroll in Medicare? Well, again, if you're receiving Social Security benefits when you turn 65, A and B are automatic, right? And A, you qualify through Social Security. We'll go over those numbers in a second. Uh, you can't decline if you don't want Part B. And the coverage starts on the first of the month you turn 65. There is an exception if you're born on the first day of month, like let's say April 1st, you actually can sign up for Medicare uh, one month prior so that your coverage starts on March 1st. Part C and D are not automatic. You must choose a private insurer and proactively enroll. And I think this is one of the most important takeaways of the presentation today is that Medicare uh, is one of those things in retirement that every year you're going to need to sit down and evaluate the plan you have, right? You're gonna have to evaluate the new premiums that come out each year based on their inflation costs or their claim costs. And you're going to need to make sure it still uh, works for you um, for your specific health needs. Everybody has a different health situation uh, and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you know the drugs that you are taking or are not taking or they're potentially going to take for something that's maybe in your family, you're going to want to do your research on that as well to make sure that it's covered within the plan you choose. So Excuse you're not receiving. Yes, please jump what on in. If you have um, a name disease that um, makes you automatically eligible for Medicare, how does enrollment work then? Uh, so you're talking about prior to 65? Yes. Yeah, so you enroll through Social Security. So that would be the, the exception I, I spoke about earlier. Um, so disability benefits within so, uh, Medicare are available, I believe, as early as 55. Um, you will want to contact the Social Security Administration and uh, make sure you get signed up for that. And Thank you. Yes, SSA.gov. Thank you for stepping in there. And please, anyone else has a question, just step in just like that. That was perfect. Uh, if you're not receiving Social Security when you turn 65, 
you must sign up to the SSA during a Medicare enrollment period. So here are the three main enrollment periods, right? And we'll look at it graphically as well. The initial enrollment period, if you're not covered by a group plan, or if you're like at UCSD, they want you to sign up for it. So it becomes a primary payer to your UC plan. If you're already retired prior to 65, then you certainly would be signing up at 65 during your initial enrollment. Uh, then there's a special enrollment period. This is if you depart a company, let's say, uh, more, more for a private company, but um, you depart a company that uh, had a creditable plan, so you didn't have to sign up for Medicare initially, and then you leave your company and retire. This is when you'd have the special enrollment period. And then the general enrollment period, which is I affectionately call the penalty box, is if you've forgotten all of these, and we'll discuss why you would not want to sign up during the general enrollment period. So graphically here, if you just look at this, it's, let's say the month you turn 65, my birthday is November, November 26th. So I would want to sign up for Medicare and choose all the different facets, whether I'm going to go down the Medicare Advantage route or if I'm going to go down traditional Medicare and get a supplemental plan and a Part D prescription plan, I'm going to sign up at, at either three, two, or one month prior, right? I don't want to sign up the month I turn 65. So I wouldn't want to sign up in November. I'd want to go back to October, September, or even August, get it all set up so that it starts on the very first day that I of the month that I turned 65. Again, I'm born on November 26th, so it'd start for me November 1st. Then you have what's called delayed start, where you have the three months after, so the month you turn, and then the three months after, those are the four delayed starts. And then what happens if you wait until the last um, if you wait the last four months, your initial enrollment period to sign up for Part B, your start date coverage will be delayed to the beginning of the following month, which you don't want to do because then you're going to have some gaps, and you certainly don't want any gaps in your health care coverage. So who signs up for Part A during the <clears throat> uh, initial enrollment period? Well, almost everyone who turns 65. You have to check with the benefits administrator still working and covered by a large plan, right? You may be advised to enroll and again, this is for UCSD has its own specific things it wants you to do. And the year when they do the Medicare presentation, I'm sure they'll go through exactly what they, they want you to do. But uh, you may be advised to enroll in a Part A to enhance hospitalization coverage not offered under an employer plan. And that's, again, more for people that are um, working for a private employer out there outside of the UCSD. So if you have a spouse or someone um, that uh, works outside of the UCSD system, that's where that would come into play. And just remember, if you do sign up for Part A uh, or you're, it, it, if it's optional for you and you are contributing to an HSA, you no longer can contribute to an HSA <laughs> once you have signed up for Part A. All right, who signed up for Part B during the initial enrollment period? Well, people who are not covered by that comprehensive plan, similar to Part A. Those that are not working, self-employed, uh, employed by a company, a small company without a creditable plan, someone that's on COBRA because they left a company, uh, they're receiving retiree health benefits, or someone employed by a company whose health plan is less comprehensive than Medicare. And then who signs up for Part D? Well, very similar, right? People have signed up for Part A and B and need prescription drug coverage, right? So if you're not going on the Medicare Advantage route, you're going for a Medicare supplement plan, you're gonna need to check maybe uh, drug, uh, uh, the drugs that you need are included in that plan, but it's also possible that they're not, and you're gonna need a standalone prescription drug plan, which is known as Part D. All right, so if you don't go into the uh, initial enrollment period, as I said, there's a special enrollment period. For Part B, it's anytime before coverage ends, and the eight month period starting after the month the group coverage ends. Special enrollment for Part D, for whatever reason, is a little different. It's 62 days or anytime before coverage ends. If you are not a part of the UCSD system and you're here as a spouse of um, a UCSD um, or excuse me, RST member, uh, one of the big things you want to think about as you're leaving your company is to get all of your, or retiring, to get all of your Medicare coverage set up before your last day on payroll so there's no gaps in coverage. Best time to enroll to avoid late penalties is sign, is sign up during the initial or special enrollment period, right? Sign up before the current coverage ends. The general important enrollment period, which I call the penalty box, if you missed your initial or special enrollment period, then you go to the general uh, enrollment period and you sign up in January, February, March, and coverage does not start until July 1st. So there's a big gap there. You certainly don't want that to happen. So avoid at all costs the general enrollment period. So again, just a quick recap. There's the initial enrollment period, which we talked about, best time to sign up, the three months prior to the month you turn 65, unless your birthday's on the first, then you can take it back then. 
an extra month, right? So that's the best time, special enrollment period for those people leaving a company, maybe retiring or being let go for whatever reason, then that would be the special enrollment period. And then again, the general enrollment period, which you do not uh, want to sign up during that time frame, is that January through March 31st and the coverage starts on July 1st. Simply, how do you do it? You go to ssa.gov and you click on that button that says apply for Medicare benefits. You can also call the Social Security Administration at that number right there, 800-772-1213, and probably stay on hold for a couple hours, but you will get a hold of someone eventually. All right, so how to sign up for Medicare Part D. You now, if you decide again that you may not have to sign up for Part D because it may be included in your Medicare Advantage plan if you do that with drug coverage, so you don't have to shop for the plan. <clears throat> But if you do traditional Medicare, traditional Medicare, you're going to want to uh, research your prescription drug plan while you are researching what Medicare supplement, because those should go hand in hand. All right, so part two. Medicare and private insurance, how do they work together? Well, premiums are nearly half of Medicare beneficiary out-of-pocket health spending, according to this study from the Kaiser Family Foundation in 2016. Premiums accounted for roughly 42%. And then services and the receipt of those services accounted for the remaining 58%. Out of, here are the out-of-pocket costs paid by Medicare beneficiaries. You have premiums, right? The Part B premium, which in 2024 is just under $175 a month uh, without uh, including the income-related monthly adjustment, which we'll go over here in a second. You have private insurance premiums for the Part D and the Medicare Advantage plan if you go traditional Medicare. Right? You have premiums for a Medicare Advantage plan as well. Uh, your other out-of-pocket costs include deductibles, a uh, portion of the doctor bill not paid by Medicare, and then services not covered by Medicare, which is why you get a supplemental plan to help you with some of that coverage. So 2024, monthly premiums. And remember, Part A, most of you here will qualify for Part A simply through your Social Security. Uh, hold on a second. Aaron Fisher. So if we continue with the UC Advantage plan, we can still review and change within the, with the UC Medicare available plans annually at open enrollments. So the UC Advantage plan, we can still review and change within the UC Medicare. Uh, yeah, so one of the things I'm gonna get to here, Aaron, in a second is the fact that during your initial enrollment period, there's no exclusions for pre-existing conditions, all right? So during your initial enrollment period, um, Subsequently, you can be uh, refused coverage in a Medicare supplement plan after initial enrollment. Can't be denied under initial enrollment, but subsequently you can based on health. Medicare Advantage plan, you can never be denied for. So that is something to consider, um, you know, particularly if you have a you know, family-related uh, disease or something that's going to potentially come up down the road. You want to make sure that you address that in your initial enrollment period and making sure that you have the coverage that uh, uh, would go with whatever your ailment is. So Part A, you qualify for free Part A, right? Uh, if you have more than 40 quarters, which is 10 years of Social Security wage tax, right? So if you paid into Social Security for 10 years or more, you have no Part A. If you paid 30 to 39 quarters, uh, it's 278 a month. And then if you work less than 30 quarters, right, then it's 505 per month. The Part B in 2024 is $174.70, but that's only if you are not subject to the income-related monthly adjustment. And remember, if it's an income-related monthly adjustment, if you are a part of that, you need to remember that it's not just you, but you and your spouse will have to pay that IRMA as well. And Part D is paid to the private insurer, varies with plans, and also subject to that same IRMA. All right. Here's the IRMA income-related monthly adjustment for 2024. If you're married, filing jointly, right? If you are less than 206,000 in gross income, then it's zero. And you can see it goes rapidly from 206,258 and uh, uh, gross, or it's not adjusted gross income. Then it gets, goes up to 6990 for the B and 1290 for the D. And that would be for each spouse, of course. And then all the way down at the bottom, 750,000, and you have a very large step up. How is the IRMA uh, accounted for? I think this is a question I probably get every time I do Medicare. <clears throat> the simple answer is the IRMA is based on your tax return from two years ago. So 2024 IRMA will be based on 2022 tax return. Okay. This, so the, 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 the metric that they take into determining if you are subject to IRMA 
and include capital gains. So in Southern California, San Diego in particular, housing has seen a you know meteoric rise over the last couple of years. And if you were say to uh, retire from UCSD and then move to Arizona or something like that, or maybe you want to move here to Nevada and Lake Tahoe where I am at right now, um, so you don't have to pay any state income tax on your retirement benefits, right? Uh, if that's what you wanted to do, great. But be aware that you sell your home in San Diego and you have this big, large capital gain, uh, you could be subject to the IRMA for an entire year. And that could be both you and your spouse. And if you see down at the bottom, you had a significant gain in your home, you'd be paying an extra four nineteen thirty a month plus the $81. So that's roughly uh, $500 a month uh, for each spouse. You can see real quickly that becomes pretty expensive. So just be aware of that. If you're someone that likes to uh, you know, trade a lot of stocks or something like that, all those capital gains you're generating uh, could uh, subject you to the IRMA. So just be aware of that. Uh, I think I accidentally left this slide cylinder because that was last year's. So here's a 2024 idea of deductible, meaning the amount you will pay in a deductible. And again, this is why we get a supplement plan. This is why we get an advanced plan is so that we can cover some of these deductibles, right? So they're not all just coming out of our pocket. So part A is $1,632 per spell of illness. Uh, part B, and when I say spell of illness, you go into the hospital, uh, I don't know, you're skiing up here in Mount Rose and you you know, fall and break an arm or something like that. So that would be considered one spell of illness. And let's say you're in the hospital later in the year for influenza or something like that, or you have to go back to the hospital. That would be another spate of illness, right? So that's what it, it says per spell of illness. It's not just a one-time pay. It's per each time you are ill. And then part B is 250 uh, a year, way for some preventative services, so shots and mammograms, pap smears, et cetera, et cetera. And part D is 545 a year. Co-insurance. So remember, we've talked already about premiums. Those are something you have to pay out of pocket no matter what. We talked about how that's roughly 45% of a uh, Medicare beneficiary's budget. Uh, we've talked to now uh, premiums and we've talked to deductibles and now we're talking about co-insurance, right? So <clears throat> the amount you pay in addition to what Medicare Part A will pay, hospital, if you're in the hospital 61 days, 61 to 90, you're going to be paying 408 a day and you can see there uh, at 91 to 150, 816 a day. Skilled nursing, $204 a day for days 21 through 100. The first 20 are covered. Part B is a percentage of the assigned claims, 20% of Medicare approved. Unassigned claims, 20% of approved. 20% of approved rate plus the balance of actual charge up to an additional 15% of the approved charge. Again, this is the reason we get these Medicare supplement or Medicare Advantage plans is to help us with covering some of these costs that are not covered by the government part of Medicare. Um, if you leave here with anything other than, um, or if, if you leave here with one, I would say rule of thumb is, first of all, two rule, rules of thumb. First of all, you need to do your own research for your Medicare supplement or Medicare Advantage plan. And secondly, you need to budget these, um, and we'll go through a typical budget here, but you need to budget these expenses in on a yearly basis uh, because they will continue to rise and continue to eat up into your retirement funds if you're not doing something to curb that. So Part D coinsurance in 2024, or excuse me, I think this is from 2023, under standard drug plan, beneficiary pays $554 deductible, 25% of the drug costs after the deductible has been paid. And then a small co-payment once out of pocket spending has reached 7,400. Remember that the drug plans vary very right, widely. Um, and again, you need to do your research to determine which plan best suits whatever ailments you may have. So what Medicare does cover? Hospital, first 100% 100 of the first 60 days, 80% of the Medicare approved medical services and some preventative services. What does it not cover? And this, is, I think, is the important part because this is what we buy supplemental insurance or have an advance plan for or buy own private insurance, long-term care, right? Care delivered <clears throat> outside the U.S. So if your plan is to retire in Belize or Mexico or something like that, a nice warm weather destination other than San Diego, uh, and it's outside the U.S., just remember, you still get your Social Security check outside the U.S., but you will not have Medicare services. My mother's from Mexico City, and she wanted to retire back in Mexico uh, when when she uh, retired, she wanted to move back to Mexico. She decided not to simply because of Medicare, because she was going to have to pay a significant amount of money for a private insurance out of pocket in Mexico. Dental care, vision, hearing aids, cosmetic surgery, 
um, all the things that you would probably think, some alternative care. Some of the new Medicare Advantage plans actually do cover some of the stuff. So we've, you may want to look at some of the newer plans that are offered under the UCSD retirement plans uh, because they may cover some of the things that are listed here. What private insurance may cover and pull apart? So the reason we get the private insurance is to help us cover the deductibles and coinsurance amount, like the Part A deductible we talked about per spate of illness, <clears throat> hospital costs after 60 days, and that 20%, which is a big one, that doesn't that's not covered by Medicare and doctor visits and and uh, all the uh, different things that you may have in in uh, the Part B realm, and the amount the doctor charges over the Medicare approved amount. Prescription drugs, right? The deductible, maybe the private insurance does, maybe it doesn't. Most of the cost of certain drugs during the initial um, benefit period, but there is a portion of Part D, they call it the donut hole, where you are paying completely out of pocket and there's no co insurance. All right, Medigap policies. So this would be your traditional Medicare. It's a private health insurance for individuals sold by private insurance company and it supplements the original Medicare Part A and B and it follows the federal state laws. There's a whole bunch of standardized plans and they're identified by these different letters. Um, again, they do not work with Medicare Advantage. A Medigap policy is traditional Medicare. It is also the one that can exclude from pre-existing conditions following your initial enrollment period. During your initial enrollment period, you cannot be excluded for pre-existing conditions. Just remember that. On our Medicare Advantage plan, you can never be excluded for any conditions. These are all the different types of Medigap plans. Again, these are private insurers. Uh, offering uh, private insurance to supplement, and that's what we call a Medicare supplement plan, uh, to supplement your insurance under Part A and Part B and potentially a prescription drug plan as well. Medicare Advantage plan is, again, is a health plan option approved by Medicare. This is that Part C where everything's kind of put together in one house. I, I use the Kaiser plan as the example. Medicare pays for amount over each member's care and may have to use a specific network of doctors or hospitals, um, but they tend to be a lot more flexible uh, and they tend to include extra benefits that you don't get in the traditional supplement plan like vision or dental. So again, if you leave here with one thing, you need to take your Medicare each year um, when you're evaluating the plan that you're in and the plan you may be moving to because uh, premiums may rise significantly. You, they may uh, make it impossible to uh, see, the, the, especially if you move to a place maybe that's not as populous as San Diego, um, if you plan on moving out of state in retirement, you definitely want to do the research on the different plans offered in the area you're thinking of moving to prior to doing that move because <clears throat> they may not have the same plans. They can be very widely by geography amongst other things and pricing and premiums. Choose the policy that offers you the best coverage for what you need. Reputable companies offering these policies, right? Make sure your healthcare provider processes, pardon me, Processes the billing for the company you choose. Drug plans can, be, ben, when you're researching your drug plan, make sure that you're getting the coverage that you need for your specific plan, not just based on price. And then of course the Medicare Advantage plans vary drastically across the board. So make sure you understand exactly what you are getting in. So most Medicare Advantage enrollees are plans with at least four stars. Just a reminder, so they do have a star system. So I would, if I were searching for a Medicare plan, I would certainly look for one that is either five or four stars. And if you're not, then make sure you talk to the agent who you're speaking with about why they recommend one that's not four or five star plan. So out of pocket healthcare spending by gender and age, we can see here that spending particularly um, once you hit that age 85 skyrockets when it comes to how much you're spending on your healthcare costs, right? And the, the largest increase of course is in services because the premiums are fixed on an annualized basis. So a typical Medicare budget as of 2024. So let's start with the premiums. Okay, so you have a Part B, 174.70. Let's call your Medigap premium on a monthly basis at 250 and your Part D drug plan premium at $50. Now remember, I did not include any income-related monthly adjustment for Part B or Part D. Um, so this is just a plain simple, this would be a couple married filing jointly under 205,000 of adjusted gross income. Okay, so there are your premiums times 12, right? And then you have, uh, prescription drug out-of-pocket costs. You have the dental out-of-pocket costs, potentially vision, alternative care. And again, this is just giving you an idea. You can see there, you're almost at 7,300 and that's per one person, right? So if you have, uh, you know, two folks in, a, in a, a marriage or a partnership, you could be looking close to or near 15,000 annually uh, as part of your budget for Medicare. 
So what can cause your uh, healthcare budget to change in the future? Well, of course, the rising healthcare costs. And then we looked at the inflation numbers at the beginning of the presentation. A change in health status may, may cause you to change to a different plan that could cover the things you need. And then of course, more services not covered by insurance, but dental, vision, hearing, alternative care. And then the big one, of course, is long-term care. So according to these sources, so Fidelity did an uh, analysis and the Employee Benefit Research Institute also did, right? This is what you're going to need to have at the start of retirement to pay for future middle expenses, not including long-term care. So let's just call it 300,000. And you remember if you are taking that money or are you thinking of taking that money out of, let's say a 403B or 457 or 401K or an IRA, you're going to have to uh, pay taxes first prior to paying for this healthcare um, you know, three, let's call it 300,000 in healthcare over your retirement. So it's something you need to plan for way ahead of time and understand where you're going to reach for it if you, if and when you do need it. So long-term care, I'm not going to go much into this because I know there's a completely different presentation on long-term care here at UCSD, but it is not covered by Medicare, right? Or Medigap insurance. So there are no supplemental plans that will cover long-term care. <clears throat> Field nursing care is covered but there is no coverage after 100 days, right? And the average person that goes into the hospital that needs skilled nursing care is there for 28 days. And it, what is generally considered long-term care is um, these uh, activities of daily living. There's six different activities of daily living and or uh, a cognitive impairment that would qualify you for long-term care. Again, I, I'm not gonna go uh, much into the long-term care portion because I know that's something that you have in a, a separate presentation, but these are the, the six different activities of daily living that they use to determine. And again, if it's just two out of six, then you qualify for a long-term care event if you have long-term care insurance. That's the trigger point. That or a cognitive impairment of some kind, dementia or Alzheimer's Alzheimer primarily. Okay. Um, so again, I'm going to skip the ADLs here and just talk to you real quick about the uh, cost of long-term care today. Right, this is as 2019, so you can probably add another 20% on most of these numbers, but homemaker services at the 141 a day, and then health aid services, 144, adult day, healthcare, 75, assisted living. You can see you get to a semi-private or a private room in a nursing home, and it gets very, very pricey very quick. So why apply for long-term care? Why plan for long-term care? And I think the number one thing I... Um, like to share is what my sister and I are going through with my mother who has dementia and we have had quite a tough time finding a facility that would not only take her in Texas, but also um, that she could afford under her limited budget. So what I always tell our clients that we work with or people at UCSD is just have a plan. Make sure you sit down with your family, particularly your kids, uh, and, and understand what the plan is for a long-term care event or potential long-term care event. So three reminders that will be done here. One, enroll in Medicare on time or you're gonna be subject potentially to that uh, uh, penalty on part B and part D. So make sure you enroll in Medicare on time. Remember it's the three months prior to the month that you turn age 65. Stop carefully for private insurance to go with Medicare. You got two options, you got the Medicare Advantage route and you've got the traditional Medicare route with a supplement and potentially a prescription drug plan. Please, please, please do your research each and every year during the open enrollment time frame, you know, October, November time frame. Make sure you're doing research. Find a trusted insurance broker that does Medicare uh, supplement plans if you need to. If you're outside of the UCSD network, obviously within the UCSD network, you have some great supplement and advantage plans to choose from, which I know uh, someone else from the university will go over those, um, those different choices uh, when they come in and speak with you guys. And reminder number three is plan for higher health care costs in retirement. I don't think it's any, there's any secret that healthcare inflation has long led over uh, just our base CPI, basic uh, inflation rate. So make sure that you are planning accordingly when it comes to your healthcare expenses in retirement. And so with that being said, I am concluding there and I'll open it up for any questions. Anyone have anything in particular that I didn't cover or I did cover 